Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Richard Dennis from the Australia Institute, and I'll be chairing this morning's session. It's a jam-packed session up the front, and it's pretty uh, crowded at the back too, which is great. Uh, so all of our speakers are going to stick to their 10 minutes ruthlessly, or I will, uh, because we've got five presentations to get through, which is one more than four, uh, which means it's going to be tight. So uh, thank you everyone for coming along. Uh, our first speaker isn't here with us yet, so we're going to start off uh, with Ingrid. Forgive me, we haven't had a chance to for me to check your pronunciation of your surname, Ingrid. Uh, but um, uh, Ingrid's going to be talking about using the carbon take back obligation to help phase out fossil energy production. So over to you, Ingrid. So I'm Ingrid. I'm here with University of Oxford and Oxford Net Sierra. Uh, and I'm here to talk about using the carbon take back obligation to help fo phase out fossil energy production. Uh, this is a concept that's based on a few other papers uh, by, by Allen, uh, Miles Allen and Jenkins, uh, uh, to name a few, and reports in Netherlands. Uh, but this is sort of a conceptual think piece that we've been working on. So we propose a carbon take back obligation to help us do two things. So phase out fossil fuel production and abatement uh, certainty and insurance. And I'm going to explain why. <laughs> so on the first one, we phase out production and uh, it's based on producer responsibility. And the rationale behind this is we've all seen it before. We're increasing uh, with higher fossil fuel prices, more extraction and more consumption, especially the rebound consumption after COVID now. And one other rationale is that we're also seeing increasing support for fossil fuel subsidies uh, surging. This is obviously from, from the last uh, during COVID, where it's almost doubled in fossil fuel subsidies across 51 countries. Uh, and lastly, the fossil fuel profits have also increased massively over the last year, uh, in dollars, billion. Um, and what to do with this is what carbon take back is supposed to, to help with. But the second rationale is, is abatement certainty. And we know that uh, uh, fossil fuel production or fossil fuel supply needs to go down. We know that demand needs to be reduced of such goods, but in certain estimates, we can come up to sort of 75% without carbon capture and storage or without re a carbon removal. And 70, this is all, uh, in 108 of 116 of the AR5 IPCC scenarios, CCS was included. Um, and this is something that we try to tackle. Uh, just to say that 75 or those 75 to 25 ratio can obviously be, be discussed, and there's a lot of uncertainty there. But even in a 90 to 10 scenario, we still need uh, carbon capture and storage. So this is not right now being incentivized by the carbon prices. The carbon prices, as we see, is much lower than both CCS and direct air capture. Uh, so we're not seeing large scale deployment right now. And I also want to highlight this number that only 0.3% of, of energy transition investments went into to CCS, which is, I guess, up here somewhere. Um, and that's worrying when we know that that's the last maybe 10 to 20% of our emission reduction or capture to reach 1.5. So we are proposing then that we need to actively do something with fossil fuel production uh, and act actively manage this. And this is the current scenario. Uh, we have no CCS in integrated into the supply chain. There's no accountability or producer responsibility. Uh, hence, we are proposing a carbon capture, uh, a carbon take back obligation where this where you have a extended producer responsibility and it's a new license to operate so if a producer wants to uh, to extract fossil fuels from the ground then they need to capture and geologically store uh, an equivalent amount of co2 emissions this is done by paying ge geological storage operators uh, uh, or buying a, a cert uh, carbon certificate unit and you can see the loop and it would start with a small fraction 
uh, and leading after a while to a higher incentivization of also direct air capture. Uh, and, and you see the, the process there. And as you see, I also want to highlight that there is a demand effect depending on, on, uh, uh, on the elasticity and how much is, is handed over to consumers. So this is, as I said, this is an active regulation of market regulation and it's a new license to operate and that's what we're proposing. Quickly to go through our sort of think piece is how do you get to phase out? And the first thing would for us be a step one would be to create uh, a CTBO club with a few leading countries. So a climate storage club, uh, maybe most relevant would be North Sea in the beginning because there's a lot of storage capacity and also producer countries. The second step would be to include CTPO requirements into uh, exports and imports deals. Uh, this is to both pressure companies to include scope three emissions, but also countries to include this in their trade calculations. Uh, and you can then start reg uh, uh, regulating which regions you're, you're trading with and how you're adjusting the sort of price of those fossil fuels. The fourth, the third step would be worldwide CTBO policies and thus increasing the storage uh, fraction because that's when you can have or don't get disadvantaged in competitiveness when you have enough CTBO countries or regulated countries and thus get to 100%. This is step four. 100% storage obligation is geological net zero achieved. So storage out of the ground, equal amount into the ground. So there's a geosphere balance, but some fossil fuels are still used. This is quite a few scenarios where fossil fuels are still used at net zero capacity. So we include the step five and step six, where step five says we go above 100% to include overshoot or historical responsibility. And this can incentivize and make sure that we get to step six, where the phase out is complete of fossil fuels. And it's a very regulated and managed process. So lastly, I just want to highlight uh, why CTBO. I think this is a, is a new kind of supply side policy. What it does is really focus on producer responsibility, including obviously the, the phasing out of fossil fuels in the long run, but producer responsibility with active regulation and active management. And we've talked about that for the last two days is how that managed out has to be gradual. It has to also take other things into consideration and CTPO does that in a supply side way. I also think this, or we think this is com complementary with other supply side policies. So you can have bans on certain unconventional uh, uh, sources. You can, uh, uh, obviously it's, uh, everything on demand side is, is included. And this is up to design choice uh, and the individual countries or regions that are going into these clubs. But what I think is also really important is that it is an enabler for geologically uh, capture or carbon storage which is a risk and that's going to be my final point this is one policy that sort of accepts or not accepts but it's a risk that even though we do a lot of phase out of or a lot of demand reduction this is there is still a risk that we will generate more co2 than we can afford to dump in the atmosphere and this is the insurance to make sure that even in thus such a case we can get to 1.5. Uh, and at that point, we can choose between publicly funded, government funded carbon capture and storage or direct air capture. We can have an industry funded CTBO, or we can not meet the climate targets. And for us, the industry funded CTBO is the best option. So even in a situation with, with higher renewable energy and demand reduction, uh, this is the way to get the fossil fuel uh, uh, companies and producer countries to include and join the cleanup of their waste, which is their CO2. So that's it. <laughs>
Why is our community losing so many analysts into the finance sector, the banks, on ridiculous salaries? The answer to that question is because I think even the biggest banks and shareholders of the fossil fuel system know it's coming to an end. And they're just having to try and figure out uh, what this means for their balance sheets and their equity exposures. So Carbon Tracker, a non-profit, um, many of my colleagues have, like myself, have come from finance or, or for the investment banks so as analysts or portfolio managers. Um, and we look at everything through the lens of financial markets. Mike's going to do the bulk of this presentation, but um, I just want to give you some quick, some highlights. Is um, new methodologies are being developed for coal retirement and for oil and gas retirement. And don't underestimate the significance of initiatives such as GFANS, the Glasgow Finance Alliance for Net Zero. I'm, I'm on the advisory board and they've got two working groups, one on coal retirement finance mechanisms, which has been developed by Rocky Mountain Institute, Climate Bonds Initiative and a few others. It's being really driven by the banks, particularly the likes of JP Morgan and City and HSBC. The other is the oil and gas retirement um, program. Um, and then um, you've got other initiatives from the uh, from like Climate Action 100 is really important if you're not familiar with it. If you go onto our website, onto the company profile section, we've given retirement schedules for, for power utilities and for also for oil and gas. Um, and this is a $60 trillion coalition that's taking on the world's top 200 polluters. They're using data from the Transitions Pathway Initiative. They're using it from Influence Map um, and from other NGOs, including Carbon Tracker. And then you've got the Science Based Targets Initiative. Um, you've also got the World Benchmarking Alliance oil and gas um, guidelines. Why do I mention all of this? It's incredibly complicated. And in it, the other, if there is such a thing as another side, they're using their influence to try and change outcomes. So they're picking scenarios that allow for huge amounts more oil and gas. Uh, or they're picking dates that don't make any sense on the retirement. And the reason for that is because of there's a huge amount of money at stake. That's what I want to say. I, can, I want to talk about it afterwards if we get the chance, but Mike's going to get into some of the detail and particularly he knows there's one slide that is really critical. I hope you spend more than a minute on it, Mike. <laughs> so how long do I have left? <laughs> so I think I've got about eight minutes left, so we'll go for that. Perfect. So what I'd like to do today is just really give a bit of a high level overview of some of our work and our approach. And um, increasingly, the work we do is focusing around, um, obviously, the raising awareness of, well, oh, sorry, our core mandate is to raise awareness of uh, the financial risks of climate change and po pol uh, policy change and the risks that places to, to investors and to, and to companies. But increasingly, we're factoring in um, the role, uh, the energy transition and the new technologies and the risks that those pose to. So sort of a two pronged approach. I'd really like to give a high level overview um, of some of our work and, and how we're integrating a bit more of the um, sort of that energy transition side of things uh, and the new technologies, particularly, for example, electric vehicles. vehicles. Um, some highlights of some of the work that we've published this year and, and sort of a, a sort of, I suppose, a taster of some of the things that, that, that we're going on to do uh, coming up. Okay, so that doesn't work. Okay, so um, this won't be news to anybody in the room. To limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C, 90% of fossil fuels reserves must stay in the ground as unburn unburnable carbon. And Christoph covered that very well yesterday. I think if we look at the, the middle column there, and so this is just in the CO, gigatons of CO2 of embedded emissions. Uh, on the left, you've got the sort of total and proved reserves. And the middle column, you've got the listed reserves in gas, oil, and coal. Sorry, the reserves uh, owned by the listed companies. So... And then on the right, you've got the remaining carbon budget to 1.5, 1.75, and then and then 2 degrees C. So very broadly, the listed company reserves alone would take us to 2 degrees C. So this is not just a national oil company problem. This is very much a problem for listed companies. And I think that's that's the key takeaway from here. Um, so we talk about um, reaching sort of climate goals from the IEA scenarios. And we saw a great presentation yesterday from Christoph on that. But, but we're also thinking about Okay, so there's the policy action on climate, but what about the technology trends? And so this is a, a slide that some of my colleagues put together looking at EV sales. And so on the left, you've got that sort of S-curve of EV deployment, so electric vehicle sales. Um, and it's broadly equivalent to, to market penetration. And we're at the very early point on the curve, perhaps you can't see it at the back, but sort of here, sort of around the 10% of global sales. And actually over the coming years through the end of the decade, we will come um, 
by the, in the start of the 2030s that the vast majority of new vehicles globally being EVs uh, under some scenarios. What does that do to, to total oil demand on the demand? Well, peak and plateau uh, right now, and then plunging through the, 20, the late 2020s in, into the 2030s as a result of obviously uh, road transport being around 50% of global oil demand. So, so clearly, uh, that's a non-linear transition. And I think if we look at some of the IEA scenarios, um, they're very useful for all sorts of purposes, but actually, um, and other scenarios, don't necessarily always factor factor that shape in. So it's increasingly something we're trying to integrate into our work uh, and understand the various implications for that. Cool. So I think, I think the point we're really trying to press here is whether the path is low carbon or a climate path or it's a fast transition path through new technologies the result actually for investors is kind of the same it's it's demand that falls um, and i won't go through the slide in in massive detail other than um to say the, the gray is the future supply from existing projects so we use data for rice and this is just oil and we we model global oil and gas markets um the 1.5 net zero emission scenarios in green, so clearly we sort of broadly consistent with the IEA's no new, no new projects in a 1.5 world. Under a slightly slower transition, SDS, sustainable development scenario, there's a small gap, but, but companies are broadly planning on business as usual, something around the stated policy scenario, 2.7 degree, a kind of, you could call that a slow transition. So clearly if, if the world, if the world follows a, uh, oh, sorry, the mouse does work. If, if, if the world and companies plan on building infrastructure for a, for a slow transition, uh, a high temperature outcome, but actually the world does uh, follow a, a faster transition, then they'll invest it, invested a load of assets that ultimately are not needed. And I think the word stranded assets has been used a lot over the last couple of days. We're, we're trying to, we use it in the context of the building of the stuff. It's the infrastructure that then becomes financially stranded rather than the resources in the ground itself. So, so just sort of just a piece on terminology there. Um, I know this is blindingly obvious, but low and expected demand impacts future returns, but it is, there's two main things, but the main impact is actually through price. So lower demand, fewer new projects, you, your marginal cost needed to incentivize new new production is lower, lower pricing, um, and that impacts the, the production uh, revenues from existing projects, and also you need fewer projects. So it's critical that companies plan for this long-term demand, but it's particularly critical they plan for the, the rapid changes. So that S-curve of EV development, the pace uh, and timeframes is something that we think is really important to push here. Um, Over-investing now based on long-term demand, and that's, that's the real issue. Um, and and it's that different the difference in the timescales between between the short um sorry between oil and gas projects versus the pace of change so we write for a broad range of financial stakeholders um and so sort of three main groups of stakeholders here you've got the asset owners the asset managers and the policy makers so from the asset owners it's understanding well actually do oil and gas uh, investments match their asset and their liabilities um does the strategy of oil, oil and gas companies support the beneficiaries' wishes? So, for example, uh, if you're a pension fund a manager, do oil and gas companies' strategies actually fit what your beneficiary is looking for, both from investing sustainably, sustainably, sorry, but also investing for impact? For asset managers, actually, is continuing uh, to invest in oil and gas or have funds that are invested in oil and gas companies, does that actually fit what the asset owners you're working for actually want? Um, are you using appropriate indices? So are you benchmarking yourself or tying yourself to an index which is totally inappropriate for the energy transition? And then from the policymaker perspective, looking at the, the loss of future national revenues or expected revenues, um, and we talked about, there was a lot of discussion on that, that yesterday, um, role of subsidies, obviously, but then finally, obviously, the, the compatibility with national climate uh, commitments. So I'm going to skip through that slide in the interest of time to get to the slide that Mark asked me to present. <laughs> Um, so we use a cost curve, so everyone just saw that cost curve approach, conscious I've got two minutes left. Um, so company risk exposure varies significantly. Now what, what this chart is showing, um, and hopefully everyone can still hear me at the back, is at 100% is your business as usual capex under the stated policy scenario. So if you're planning on that level of demand, what projects would you plan uh, with companies invest? And we model global oil and gas uh, supply and demand at the asset level and then using data from Reistad Energy or Eastad, um, and then aggregate that back up at the company level. The most exposed companies at the top of the top 30 companies by, I think, market cap in our universe, the least exposed at the bottom. This is just looking at their new projects. So this is about 
just looking at their project options, which of those were, um, sort of would go ahead and an economically rational basis uh, under business as usual, so that's 100%, but which of those are then compatible with a low demand scenario? You could say they're, they're aligned with um, sustainable development scenario, which is in the blue. So if you've got a, a big yellow bar, basically none of your new project options are compatible with a low demand scenario. Uh, conversely, you've got a bl blue, larger blue bar, more of your um, projects are compatible. You can look at this both from a risk perspective, so the loss of potential for stranded asset risk. Gosh, that's my own. Um, look at it from a stranded asset risk perspective, but you can also look at it in terms of company alignment. So the degree of company sanctioning decisions, where are they investing their capital as to actually whether companies are uh, aligned or not. And just say what the red is. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, Mark. Uh, so the red, you see on the right here, there are these projects that are even higher costs that are not compatible even with uh, a business as usual 2.7 degree scenario, particularly, um, uh, say for example, some of there are some oil sands and some uh, oil sands projects which are not even compatible, we see on an economic basis with even 2.7. So the key takeaways really there are fast transition, reduced demand, low revenues. Companies must plan for the peak uh, and transition away from oil and gas. And there's no one size fits all strategy. I think that's really, really critical message that it's not that oil and gas companies must transition to renewable energy. It's just they, uh, they plan for that peak. And the slide I've just skipped there was looking at the different shapes of some of these uh, scenarios, looking at, for example, the forecast policy scenario from inevitable policy response, where you have short term growth in oil demand and then a rapid decline. Uh, and then the final piece is really around asset owners and whether actually oil and gas investments now actually f fit from a risk return perspective um, with their investment strategies. Yeah, Mark, you want to add something? If it isn't obvious, what the banks have, and the shareholders are doing is allowing a huge amount of capex into projects which are not only outside 1.5, they're totally outside of steps, which we know is closer to 2.5, 2.7. And that's really where the battleground is being fought right now, is can we get the pension funds and the banks to cut back the funding? And on that basis, I'm, it's not clear that that's actually happening. Um, thank you. And uh, on behalf of Australia, let me assure you that in Australia we are full steam ahead. The, we are the world's third largest exporter of fossil fuels and I was glad to see that Woodside was the third worst. Bang on brand for Australia. We have 114 new coal and gas projects seeking approval in Australia today. 114, uh, they will go ahead. A lot of you met me when I was here campaigning against the Adani coal mine a long time ago. It went ahead. Remember everyone said it wouldn't? <laughs> it did. So let's hope that the... Uh, <laughs> Let, let's hope that the compelling finance arguments against overwhelming wealth and power fire up soon. Um, now, our next speaker is Leonard Stern from the Paris School of Economics, uh, and his talk is called Proportionately Matching Voluntary Contributions to Institutions Rewarding Countries for Reducing the Supply uh, of Demand in Coal and Oil. Thanks, Leonard. Thanks. Let us define um, global public good institutions to be uh, institutions with the mandate to p uh, contribute to particular global public goods in a rules-based way. So here is the inventory of current institutions. Uh, they overall receive 14 billion per year in voluntary contributions by governments. The existing institutions for uh, environmental causes are all focused on the demand side. And it would be natural to create a new institution, for example, that would uh, reward countries based on the tax rates that they have in place on the extraction of coal, thereby uh, reducing uh, supply of coal worldwide. And so the idea would be to have it rules-based, so the mandate would be to maximize the supply reduction and uh, with a given budget that the institution has. Similarly, on the, on the demand side, uh, an institution could be created, rewarding countries based on the tax rates that they have in place on the combustion of coal. And once such institution exists, there, there could be a simple matching mechanism that would run as follows. So at the beginning of the year, a proportional matching fund would accept donations. And at the end of the year, 
it would look at the voluntary contributions made to the supply reduction reward fund and the demand reduction reward fund, and then split its budget uh, in proportion to these donations. So this would incentivize countries in the first stage of this game, so over the course of the year, to donate to the institution that they prefer. And here's the result of a simple modeling exercise where countries act as, as unitary players. And it turns out that in the first stage of this game, the US is uh, incentivized to give to the proportional matching fund because this will, in the second stage, incentivize the exporters and the importers, uh, the, the largest ones, to donate to the, the respective institutions. So what we see here in the, in the first line is the total contribution that the US makes. And in the second line on the left is Australia's uh, contribution. So Australia donates, purely for self-interested reasons in this model, to the fund that globally rewards all countries for reducing the supply of coal. And Japan, on the other hand, donates to the corresponding institution on the demand side, Japan being the largest importer of coal. So they have an interest in globally reduced um, demand for, for coal. And so anticipating this response, uh, the, this, this is why the US has here strong incentives to uh, give to the proportional matching fund, uh, because it leads to overall enhanced climate change, change mitigation. Now, if countries instead uh, manage to coordinate so that the largest players in each of these three categories act, act together, we get a quadrupling of funding uh, at the equilibrium, uh, reaching almost 16 billion per year. Now, desiderata for international mechanisms, uh, here at least there's at least uh, one that this mechanism satisfies, namely it incentivizes fossil fuel exporters to participate. Another desideratum is to reduce the rents accruing to, accruing to uh, fossil fuel exporters, given the resource curse. And with the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, this has arguably be, become a pressing priority. The mechanism just outlined is ambiguous in terms of it, the second desideratum. It depends on how well the exporters of the fossil fuels coordinate versus the, the importers. So what I'll present for the rest of the presentation is a mechanism that satisfies both desiderata, in, an, uh, in a robust way. So here are six institutions um, for global public good provision. And what is shown is an estimate of how countries are affected uh, given a dollar that is added to the budgets of the different institutions. So all these are, according to these estimates, all these, uh, all these uh, gains are below one. So any of these players, when they give one dollar to an institution, they derive less than one dollar of benefit. So without any mechanism, we should self-interested players, um, we should expect them to not, to not donate. Another thing to note here is that the Middle East is, and, and Russia and Eurasia, they're all adversely affected by the clean development mechanism and a proposed carbon pricing reward fund because they reduce the demand for, for fossil fuels. And it's very significant. So. This is the motivation for the mechanism I will now uh, outline. The proposal is to create a club where members would be obliged to tax the, the international flights that depart from the territory and also all the international flights that arrive from non-participants. Secondly, they would have to allocate the collected tax revenues to institutions of their choice. They would also have the option to instead retain a certain fraction of the revenue but in that case, they wouldn't be able to decide where the rest is allocated to. This is here for the case of international aviation emissions, and the simulations I'll show are, are based for that. But it's equally applicable to maritime emissions. Here is a representation of the mechanism. So in the first line is a representation of the tax revenues that uh, the different regions of the world collect by participating in this mechanism. And, and therefore taxing the, the emissions from international flights. In the second line is their strategy. So here it turns out that Africa gives all the money it collects to the global funds for AIDS and TB, TB and malaria because it's the one that it gains most from. And the EU in this case donates a part to the international thermonuclear reactor, but the remaining part that is not in colors is not allocated by the EU. And therefore the EU can retain a certain fraction of that revenue for itself. That's the part in black. 
But the great part, the EU no longer gets to decide where it goes. So let us collect all the direct contributions made by countries to the different institutions. And here is a collection of all the, this grey money that hasn't been allocated by countries. The mechanism now divides this great money between the different institutions in proportion to how much they've received in the context of these mechanisms by the different countries. So this enhances countries' incentives to give to their preferred institution because now part of the grey money also gets, uh, gets allocated there. And this is the final allocation once we add up these indirect contributions and the direct ones. What's shown here is, turns out to be a Nash equilibrium in this game. Now, here's a simple modification of the mechanism that builds on the idea introduced initially, this proportional matching fund idea. And now countries would have an additional option, namely to give to proportional matching funds. So they could say um, they should, should support a subset of institutions. And that's what the Middle East does here, for example. They give to a matching fund that supports all the institutions that don't drastically reduce the demand for fossil fuels. And China does a mixture. They give a part to the clean development mechanism. And then they support a matching fund supporting the clean development mechanism, but also the carbon pricing reward fund that equally uh, reduces the demand for fossil fuels. Here is just a collection of all these contributions. And the rules are the, of the mechanisms are now as follows. The grey money that hasn't been allocated gets matched to the matching funds. So on the basis of how much the matching funds have received, the grey money is split. Now we can collect these indirect contributions to the matching funds and the direct ones that's shown here. And in the last stage, the, each of the matching funds uh, splits its budget in proportion to the direct allocations that have remained to the institution that it supports. So the matching fund supporting the blue and brown gets split between blue and brown in proportion to the direct allocations made to blue and brown. And similarly for the other matching fund. Here's the final allocation that results from that. What's shown here turns out to be a Nash equilibrium again. And what's striking is that the Middle East donates all its money to this proportional matching fund shown here. Let us see what happens if the Middle East instead doesn't allocate any of its money. So here is the situation where they instead retain as much money as they can, which is 45% of the tax revenue. But then they don't get a, in a sense, don't get a, get a say about where the other, other money goes. And if we compare the two allocations that result, we see that there's a drastic increase in the allocations for the institutions that reduce the demand for fossil fuels. Because by not donating to the matching fund, all the grey money gets allocated to the matching fund that supports the institutions that reduce the demand for fossil fuels. And then that translates into, into this change that we see here. So we see that the blue and the brown are drastically uh, increased if the, the Middle East doesn't exercise its right to influence the allocation. And that's why it's actually better off to not retain any of, uh, any of the tax revenue it collects and instead to donate it all to the proportional matching fund, supporting all the institutions that it doesn't dislike. So even without having any supply reduction reward fund in the mix, we get the, the oil exporters to participate. Now we can simulate what would happen if the EU and China were to initiate the mechanism and afterwards in uh, countries asynchronously decide whether to join or not. So I run a, a simple algorithm where at each stage, at each step, uh, a random country is selected, a random player, and the country, the player gets to one minute, yeah, um, gets to decide how to adjust the strategy and I assume that each player just plays in a self-interested way a best response given what the others are currently doing. And we see that here the results as a function of the retention rate parameter, that is how much do countries, can countries retain if they don't exercise the right to influence, if they don't allocate the money. And if it's at least 40%, we always converge to a situation where all countries participate. And we can directly compare here in uh, yellow and, uh, and red the two mechanisms that I've outlined. So having the proportional matching funds in the mix 
So that's the yellow one. We get, get drastically better performance. We can raise much more revenue for global public good institutions of all. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Ian Steed uh, from Econias, and his talk is entitled, So You Want to Quit Producing Fossil Fuels? Yes. Um, <laughs> putting the manage into manage decline. Uh, just while you're doing that, so thank you, Richard, and thank you to the Stockholm Environment Institute for inviting me to a conference on fossil fuel supply and climate change um, when I am neither an expert in fossil fuel supply nor climate change. <laughs> Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll try and figure out why I'm here. So my, my background is in economics and fiscal policy. So I am a former senior tax policy advisor to the UK Treasury. And after last week's budget, I very much stress the word former advisor. <laughs> and uh, more recently, over the last sort of six or seven years or so, um, I have been advising developing country governments on how to negotiate better contracts for extractive projects, focusing on getting them a higher share of the financial benefits through better fiscal regime design and tackling international tax avoidance. And one of our key partners is an organisation called Connex. Uh, Connex is a German-led initiative uh, that GIZ, the German Development Agency, runs. And Connex aims to sort of level the playing field in negotiations between uh, developing countries and extractives companies um, by providing expert legal, financial and industry advisors. Um, Connex do not support negotiations for fossil fuel projects. I should emphasize that point. Um, but what they've done recently is they've asked us to think about how could we use the kinds of analysis and techniques we use in negotiations for projects um, to a slightly different question is how could you apply that to the question of keeping fossil fuels in the ground? So, you know, can you construct deals with, com with countries that would help them to keep fossil fuels in the ground and compensate them for that? So I won't go through um, the points that have already been excellently made by Christoph yesterday and by uh, Mark and Mike this morning over the need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, what I will say is we've been asked to sort of think about three questions. First, how would you go about at a macro level identifying potential uh, fossil fuel projects to keep in the ground? Secondly, at a sort of micro project level, how would you evaluate the costs and benefits of that? And then third, are there any sort of low hanging fruit where you could start sort of piloting deals about keeping it in the ground? Now, there are already some current and past initiatives in this space. Um, you are probably all more familiar with these than I am, so I won't go through them now. Um, we may, if you want to talk about them afterwards in the Q&A or in the coffee break, we can talk about them then. Um, so firstly, the sort of macro question, how do you identify potential projects? So uh, we have considered firstly a very simple uh, taxonomy over two axes. Uh, firstly, whether the project is primarily for export or for domestic supply. And we think that um, deal making is probably a little bit easier for exporters than it is for domestic supply, primarily because you have fewer players involved. You're basically talking about the host government and the uh, international companies. Um, and secondly, you have uh, fewer criteria to evaluate because it mostly comes down to money. You know, what are the cash flows that the company would, would kind of achieve after tax? What are their future profits? What can the government collect through fiscal revenues um, and a small number of sort of direct jobs and indirect benefits? Um, whereas if you're talking about domestic supply, I think it becomes a lot more complicated. You have more actors involved because you have to think about domestic energy supply companies. You move downstream, you have to think about consumers in the household and industrial sectors. Um, and you have to think about other issues that aren't money, right? So you have to think about supply security. You have to think about um, direct jobs, indirect jobs down supply chain, indirect benefits. It just becomes a lot more complicated. However, if it's easier to construct deals in the export sector, there is a big caveat, which is the risk of carbon leakage is much greater because you can stop one field being developed, but the importers of fossil fuels can simply go to another field. So you're not necessarily securing additional carbon savings. Um, the second axis is whether you're looking at uh, projects that are in the planning stage or projects that are already producing. Um, again, similar issue, we think at the planning stage it's much harder to prove the additionality of any carbon savings, 
um, the valuation is probably more difficult as well because there's greater uncertainty and you probably create a set of perverse incentives um, both for governments and for companies to prove up resources so that they can then get involved in deals not to extract them um, and take the money that's on the table to keep it in the ground. So a lot of issues around um, doing this at the planning stage. But if you were trying to de decommission a project that's already producing earlier than it would automatically be de decommissioned, then you probably have a much harder to achieve deal because you've got issues around incumbency. So states are already dependent on the oil and gas revenues. Uh, the companies have already sunk the investment costs, so they're now already at the profitable stage. Um, and you have incumbency issues around sort of, you know, political elites who benefit from oil and gas, who benefit from coal projects and are in control of public policy. So um, much more harder to achieve um, and potentially less value for money because with the investment costs already sunk, you're compensating just for the profits and the future cash flows. So no real easy answers there. Um, another way of thinking about this, again, at the macro level is to look at the rents from different uh, projects. So the rents are plotted on the vertical axis and then the sort of income level of the country. So we've got GDP per capita on the horizontal axis and then the, the size of the bubbles are the amount of production. And you've got three colors. You've got light blue, which is coal, dark blue, which is gas and orange, which is oil. And a couple of um, obvious sort of results from this kind of analysis. Firstly, coal rents are uniformly lower than oil and gas, which I think is a fairly well-known finding, which suggests that there's better VFM if you were to decommission coal earlier. Um, and secondly, there's this cluster in the bottom right of relatively low rent projects in high income countries. And they would be an obvious place to start if you were looking to, to keep it in the ground. Uh, not necessarily the area that we would get involved in as people who advise uh, lower income countries. So then at the micro level, well, how do you go about assessing individual projects and whether this makes sense or not? So firstly, we've got a very simple economic framework in which we say the costs are local. And by costs, I mean the opportunity costs of not developing or not producing. So for the host countries, there's an opportunity cost in terms of the fiscal revenues foregone, in terms of jobs, in terms of indirect economic benefits. And for the companies and the investors, there's an opportunity cost in terms of the unrealized future cash flows and profits. Um, secondly, the benefits in this framework are obviously the carbon saved from not uh, from keeping the fossil fuels in the ground. Um, those benefits are global rather than local benefits, although they're not felt evenly around the world because estimates of loss and damage vary by country and region. Um, nevertheless, there's a mismatch between where the benefits accrue and where the costs accrue in a sort of spatial sense. Um, and that suggests that you would really be looking for sort of global regional actors to be compensating specific countries to keep fossil fuels in the ground um, because of that mismatch of the, the costs and the benefits. And actually interesting, there was a the plenary session on Indonesia earlier where even within a country, the costs exceed the benefits, the upfront capital needed to transition, so to decommission coal in that um, instance, is so high that they still seek international support to make it happen. So even if the cost benefits stack up, there's likely to be a role where you need uh, inward flows of capital from international organizations. And then quantification of this is, is very challenging. So the way that we would approach this is a pretty, pretty standard cost benefits analysis. Um, in this case, the, the, the costs are the financial benefits if the project goes ahead because the costs are the opportunity costs of not doing that. So this is fairly standard stuff for those of us who work in kind of um, investment appraisal or forecasting tax revenues. You can develop a, a model of a project, a cash flow model. You can estimate the fiscal take from that. You can estimate the investor returns. In this framework, they become the costs of keeping fossil fuels in the ground. The Benefits are the, the, the emissions that are the not produced, the emissions that are saved, which would be both the sort of supply chain emissions and the combustion emissions. And then you can use a carbon price to attach a financial value to that. And then again, in standard cost benefit analysis, we're looking at cash flows over a long period of time. So you can use a discount rate to collapse all of that into a present value. You know, if the costs uh, exceed the benefits, you have a negative net present value. It doesn't look like it's a, it's a good project to, to do this kind of uh, keep it in the ground approach for. If the benefits outweigh the cost, then there's something there. Um, but this is, of course, very challenging because we know that commodity prices are very volatile um, and they're very difficult to forecast. So if you're doing this at a point in time with a specific oil price, well, 
if the oil price changes, it increases or it decreases, then the fundamentals of the cost benefit change. That's also a problem for deal making because if you're trying to fix compensation up front, which was the case with the Yusuni National Park in Ecuador, then when oil prices change, the value of compensation suddenly looks like a better or worse deal, depending on which side of that deal you're on. Um, and similarly, uh, carbon prices are volatile as well, so lots of movement in the costs and benefits. Uh, secondly, there's uncertainty in the key data, particularly around supply chain uh, emissions and combustion emissions. There are some areas where you think actually emissions are likely to be high. These are older, um, more depleted oil fields or light gassy fields with high flaring. And then thirdly, there's contestability over discount rates. So we know that um, lower income countries tend to have higher country risk premium which means that um, if you're discounting, it implies that you're going to pay less compensation to lower income countries than you would pay to higher income countries, which I think is problematic from an equity perspective. And then risk premium really should vary depending on where you are in the project life cycle. So you should have a higher uh, discount rate for um, early exploration and a lower discount rate for producing assets. So just very quickly to finish, are there any low hanging fruit? And um, I'm relatively pessimistic on this one, I'm afraid, because every time you see an opportunity, you very quickly see a counter argument. So projects with low financial benefits would imply lower compensation costs, but those are the projects that are least likely to get developed anyway. Secondly, higher potential emission savings from decommissioning the late stage fields, um, but the investments are already sunk, the discount rates are lower, so the costs of compensation are higher. Um, third, you have higher discount rates at the expiration stage, which again implies lower compensation costs. But all you're doing there is pre preventing future emissions. You're not doing anything about the current stock of emissions from fossil fuels. And again, it's harder to prove the additionality. And then finally, this point about compensating lower income countries where country risk premium are higher, um, would lower income countries accept that? You know, would they accept lower compensation on the basis that they are high risk countries? And is that equitable when you have, I think, um, might have been Christoph said yesterday, lower income countries in Africa account for about 3% of the stock of emissions. Um, and even if they were to develop all of their known assets, they would only contribute 3.5%. So, you know, it doesn't seem particularly fair to be compensating them less for this problem. So uh, that's where we've got to in our thinking. I'm not presenting any results because we've not actually done the analysis yet. Um, if people are interested, it'd be great to have a chat afterwards. If you have any feedback on the methodology, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you. It's it's nice to think that um, it's it's uh, that wealthy countries know how to tax these things. But uh, <laughs> Australia is the largest exporter of LNG in the world, and Qatar comes in second, but collects twenty times more tax than Australia. Maybe we haven't noticed, or maybe we didn't want to. Um, okay, our final speaker is uh, from is Klaus Eisenhack, whose uh, speech is entitled uh, "Buy Coal and Gas." into fuel carbon gas leakage on deposit markets with market power. Klaus. So you're starting? Yeah. yeah. So you can read it as a kind of, it resonates with just the last talk. So this is another um, addition to the theory on deposit markets. So where you buy those kinks, I just learned this term from you. Um, so you buy um, coal or gas or whatever fossil fuel assets in another place in order not to burn them. So I think I don't need to repeat, repeat this basic idea here. Um, today, um, there is some theory on how this might work, but the theory is done with a single fuel. And we know there are more than one fuels in the world. Um, and they do not look too much into how this might be, these kind of markets might be implemented at all. So only if countries that sell and buy deposit agree to installing such a market, it would be there. And who would be the winners and losers of such a kind of policy? This is what we want to address here with multiple fuels. And there's another challenge with multiple fuels. So um, suppose you have installed one deposit market, say for coal, say for dirty coal. And then you say, okay, now go on to another fuel, also do something for, say, oil or gas. Um, it might be that um, the first market already shifts the terms of trade in such a way that the second one becomes less profitable. And that might be even more challenging 
if we know that there's a lot of leeway here for strategic action. Here I mean that we basically can create a kind of state monopoly. If there are states buying deposits, they rise the price of these fuels, this gas or, or coal fuels, and then they can shift the terms of trade. And the question is whether you can do or want to do this multiple times. Um, so, uh, I think in this group I spare the technical details of the model. You can read this in the paper, but the, since this is uh, abstracting away a lot of details, the basic ingredients you should know. So we're considering here basically two representative countries or maybe two groups of countries. One is caring for climate change. This is M. The other group of countries is not caring for this at all. They both own fuels. Um, they differ. Uh, those fuels differ in their carbon intensity and in their extraction costs. And there are some other uh, details. Um, with this, uh, we compare different settings. Um, so as a kind of benchmark, we can say, okay, let's stick to a case where we just have dom uh, domestic policies, no kind of deposit markets running or a social planner uh, that is globally optimal. But the more interesting scenarios are those where we have a deposit market just for the dirtier fuel, that is coal here, K, or just for the cleaner fuel, that is G here, or both at the same time, this is D for uh, deposit. Um, with these assumptions, um, we find certain sets of difficult effects. You have different leakage effects because now these two fuels become interdependent. If one becomes more expensive, the other might become more expensive as well. And those uh, more leakage effects from one fuel to the other might be gained by the participants in, in, such, a, um, in such a market. Um, so let's get to the situation. Um, where we have market power. So we assume that, for example, one government is willing, so the government of country M is willing to buy more deposits in the other country to raise the price for, say, coal, in order to uh, maybe uh, that, that the exporters or producers of this coal can sell it at a higher price. And this can be to the benefit or disbenefit of uh, coal producers in M in the country M or in the country N, depending on how deposits are shared. Um, what we can say here under some technical conditions that in the setting where you have um, both uh, deposit markets, um, global we uh, welfare in the uh, country that cares for climate will be improved. And harm H uh, stands for the damages from climate change. They will be also reduced, or they will be not down to the level of um, of the uh, first best, the global first best. So here in this setting, um, if you look on the country M as an aggregate, they gain from having both uh, both uh, deposit markets at the same time. Um, but we can also spread this up if you have just one or more, and we can, can look into what is happening in those different countries. So we can see here um, that both the countries that cares for climate change and the other country group um, prefer having complete deposit markets over just having one for coal or just having one for gas. So they are both willing to agree under these conditions here. There would be both, both country types would be willing to agree uh, to such a kind of treaty, um, which will also reduce its harm most compared to the other um, the other deposit market options. Um, this still not answer uh, whether um, uh, two deposit markets can exist in parallel at all. So this is the lower part of the slide here. What we in this in a special version of this model we can show that it might indeed work with two markets in parallel, but only if the um, cleaner fuel gas here is not too clean. If gas would be very clean compared to coal and depending on the other parameters shaped by demand and so on, um, then it might be that one market will crowd out the other. So then it doesn't work as I've shown on the previous slides. But if they work, we can also show an additional effect that um, if you have both deposit markets, then um, the fuel mix that is extracted is shifted more towards to, uh, to have a larger share of extraction of the cleaner fuel. So the overall thing at least gets a little bit cleaner in both countries, so both in the climate and in the non-climate interested um, country group. Um, finally, um, we dig into more detail on these different uh, surpluses for different kind of producers. So these are the consumers, these are the producers of coal, 
These are the producers of gas. And then things become interesting here because you can see that even the, uh, um, the coal producers would prefer having a deposit market for the own fuel over the situation where uh, we have deposit market for both fuels, while for the producers of the cleaner fuel, the gas producers, the situation is different. So they have a different strategic position when they want to support or oppose uh, those different kinds of settings. The upper line shows the situation for the consumers, they pay the price. So if, uh, if fossil producers can gain from such arrangements, someone needs to pay and these are the customers. Um, so that is uh, it's a very general um, uh, finding, uh, independent of all different kind of parameterizations you can do here. But you can see, maybe predict here, how, um, how the game might be played out. Um, so these different, to conclude, these different types of leakages between fuels, between countries and so on forth, um, uh, complicates the situation. There is leeway for strategic action to play this out. It, these strategic effects might still uh, make multiple um, deposit market coexist uh, and to the benefit at least of all countries if you take them as an aggregate um, and also yeah, with different benefit ranking for the different types of uh, or, pref or, 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 or profit rankings of the different types of fossil fuel producers um, uh, when you want to garner support for this. Um, so this is it. Thank you very much. Well, thanks everybody for sticking pretty much to time. Um, we've got 15 minutes for questions and um, I see uh, maybe this, the, the woman in front with the mask, yep. Hello. Yep. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations. Uh, I have a question for the carbon tracker methodology. And I'm interested in knowing because I guess for every fossil fuel producer, they want to be the last one, right? They want to be the last one, a producer of oil, of everything. Uh, and you have per company. So I guess you have some sort of carbon budget that you divided in some sort of way um, for the companies. And I guess that brings you again to the typical questions of equity, who should face out first and who is allowed to keep the last uh, parts of the carbon budget, which is a very political and very hard uh, question. So I'm wondering how you dealt with that in your methodology. Thanks. Yeah, so I'll go first on that. Um, can you hear me at the back? Yeah. Yep. So, so the short answer is no, we don't take a carbon budget approach. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, if you take a scenario, there's basically this much space for this volume of fossil fuels. And we're saying you have this much from your existing supply and from a, um, and then you have a supply gap. And then who from a least cost basis, so just looking at the cost curve I showed, who from a, if you just take a very economically rational approach, it's the lowest cost hydrocarbons that go ahead, factoring in applicable um, carbon pricing under, uh, uh, well, uh, sorry applicable carbon pricing so it's very much just that approach so we're not trying to say you get to do x or you get to do right this is this is how it would play out market and of course that that's that's a net that is one viewpoint but um that's that's how our model works but there's a there is an economic principle you, of utility and you have to, uh, and i'm not arguing a moral case here i'm just sort of saying hey look at it if the global price is 50 bucks and your projects have a break even of 60 bucks either out of the money why should we? Why is a remaining carbon budget going to a high cost producer? It'd be far better to give the carbon budget to a producer at five bucks who sells at fifty, and you distribute the forty-five bucks. And that's the reason why Carbon Track has partnered with the Global Registry of Fossil Fuels, which I chair, and the Fossil Fuel Treaty. Is we need an international mechanism that figures this out. Uh, markets aren't going to be able to figure figure this out. It's but it is true. Who is the low cost producer? will probably get to market first. If you've got declining demand, we anticipate not just us, but Rice and many others, lower oil prices. So we're going to enter into a period of 25, 30 bucks a barrel. Um, if, if you're tied to a country that it costs 60 to get it out, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna pay for the other 25 bucks of losses? Who's going to cover the losses? So the justice and equity principles should also think through about the effects on poor countries who are going to have to subsidise high cost producers because they've claimed a right to be the last producer. Yep. Uh, yeah, Frank. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, it's for Ingrid for the first presentation. So thanks for the presentation. It's a simple question. Uh, in terms of CO2 capture, there is a difference between the avoided CO2 emission and the CO2 that is captured because you have huge energy penalties. And in the case of direct air capture, huge energy and energy penalties related to the process. So are you planning to use LCA analysis or so on? Because if you are simply using the CO2 capture, you are not accounting for the CO2 emitted for the process because of the process of the CO2 capture, transportation and storage. But the most important thing here is the CO2 capture. You talked about direct air capture and there is a lot of energy to do that. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I won't pretend to be an expert on the process of capture and storage. Um, I'm not a technical expert, but I will say that uh, conceptually, uh, this is obviously a market that that will the CCS and what we, the energy that will be spent on on the capture element and also going into the storage that can be obviously fed in by the fact there is higher uh, efficiency of the of each reserve being used and probably the energy will come from gas then right so, or it could be electrified uh, electrified carbon capture and storage yeah but i mean that maybe maybe don't know truly the co2 that is avoided it is less than the co2 that is captured so it's important to have a certificate that is based on the LCA analysis, life cycle analysis, or yeah. so on. But if you simply use, there is no neutrality in this yeah. case. There will always be a CO2 that is emitted because of the CO2 capture. Mostly it's CO2 transportation, and injection, and storage, but mostly because of the CO2 capture. And when you go to direct air capture, there are some estimates, depending on the origin of the electricity yeah. and the thermal energy, you can emit more CO2 than to you no can capture, so you have to do this. I completely agree, and the whole yeah. the whole idea here is obviously that it should be... be so a major be issue here is to certificate the CO2 avoided emissions. This is a major issue now yeah. for some trade schemes. Um, yeah. Thank uh, you. Just behind uh, to Mike, I'll just indulgence from the chair, God bless Australia. We've just created the first carbon capture and storage uh, credit system in Australia, government regulated, where if you, where when the gas industry releases a hundred tons, if they capture one, we'll credit them for the one. The 99 are free. We will issue a credit for the one they capture, and then they can sell that credit to someone else who can then claim to be net zero. I kid you not. So yeah. There's all sorts. Leakage is not just a physical problem. It, <laughs> leakage is an accounting problem. But, but can I just meant, I, I'll just want to say that, that I think this is the really important part of this talk is that this is an idea right now, which is purely academic. It's discussed as like we need producer accountability. And I think there's a huge risk that at the rate we're going now, we don't have the technology ready to potentially mitigate that 10 to 25% risk at the end. The loopholes that you're talking about, Richard, 100% we need to cover that those loopholes are not there in a policy like this if yeah. it's implemented. Uh, it's not a loophole, it's a design feature. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's, uh... <laughs> no, like, let's stop pretending. Like, let's not pretend that this accidentally happened. <laughs> like... So, fascinating connections between all these ideas, and there's a parallel conversation going on about uh, you know, international cooperation, which is about who really pays, right? Embedded in all these ideas that you're all raising is an idea that somebody is going to figure out who redistributes what Mark was talking about, um, you know, if the lower cost producer ends up producing. So I guess my question is perhaps for our, 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 our panelists from Aconius, which is, and I think, you know, if I'm not mistaken, the carbon take back uh, obligation places the the obligation to pay on the producer, right? And so if you're a producer in a low-income country, you come with that obligation. And in a sense, how do we create the equity here? So I'm just curious, who is, 
potentially paying uh, in these ideas that you are exploring in Aconius, and is that something that can create the basis for others to pay and contribute in this kind of equity framework? And I yeah, open it up to anybody who wants to engage on that question here. Um, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, I don't have an immediate answer, and I think that is obviously part of the problem here, is that in, in the sort of conceptual framework we've got, um, it isn't going, going to be the lower income countries that are paying for their transition. It's not going to be the lower income. Com com they cannot compensate themselves for the missed opportunity of, of, um, of not developing their fossil fuel industries. So it has to come externally. Um, I think there were some interesting ideas mentioned earlier around the link between developing country fossil fuel revenues and debts and whether the scope for deals where debt forgiveness could be one way of paying lower income countries not to produce fossil fuels. Um, I think the scale of the challenge financially is so large that you're really going to be looking at IFIs or regional banks to, to put some of the money into this. Um, interestingly, if you look at the Usuni deal, there are actually, you know, um, ordinary households and consumers could buy um, whatever the obligations were called in the in the Sunni deal. Now there are various reasons why that failed, including the the price that they fixed at, and including actually I think genuine questions over the additionality over the the carbon savings. But I think we probably need to be quite creative about where the money comes from. And you know, IFIs might be a bit of a stodgy, obvious answer, and maybe debt forgiveness is in that camp as well. But you know, there are lots of interesting ways of raising funding for these kinds of initiatives, and we probably need to be quite creative about thinking where the money comes from. Can I just quickly comment on this? Uh, it's, I'm going to make an obvious statement. Uh, economics and finance are not the same discipline. The world of investment banking, corporate finance, capital markets, equity debt, capital markets is not the same as, as an economic idea. Um, and yet, and it's not really addressed here we sh at this event, we should have a come back to it, is the investment banks are all over this like a rash. How to retire coal, what's going on with the oil companies, how to negotiate, they've got governments involved. We've got G fans at the highest levels talking with the you know with the IEA and others about uh, and the reason for this is because the banks have got a huge exposure to the coal-fired power to, to to the coal production facilities and and the oil and gas projects. My concern is is that the private sector and the investment banks are are not democratically accountable. Who they're not accountable to anybody, and then they're, they're making this up. They have engaged civil society groups, and I mentioned a few earlier, you know, Rocky Mountain Institute, Carbon Tracker. Climate Bonds Initiative, um, but that's not the same thing. And there is, isn't really a, a voice from the Global South in negotiating what this transition is going to look like. Um, we should come back next year and, and actually interrogate these plans and review these plans and methodologies uh, because they're creating them for real. I and mean, we saw the huge deal from um, Prudential and the Asia Development Bank on coal retirement. We had Trafigura running around with a massive deal on coal retirement. Um, and we're going to come up with a set of financial mechanisms for coal retirement that are going to be published in a couple of months' time, um, which the big banks are going to probably come behind. Um, and we should be scrutinising these in detail with, with, with vigour. I mean, I get the papers because we're in the, the working groups and there's, I can't say too much about it, but there's some, some really shocking stuff in there. Really shocking stuff. Um, maybe time for one last question at the front. Thank you. Thanks for the very inspiring presentations. I think there's uh, some great thinking about smart mechanisms um, that can develop dynamics. Um, I have a question for Ian and then one for uh, all of you. Uh, for Ian, it's uh, whether you have considered uh, some kind of bidding mechanism where uh, whoever is ready to keep something in the ground would bid on a certain amount of money. I believe uh, Mia Motley, the Barbados Prime Minister, has suggested setting up uh, such a fund uh, in Glasgow with 500 billion per year uh, financed by the central banks and I imagine that could uh, solve some of the uh, uh, issues, uh, the challenges that you were uh, mentioning and the question for all of you is um, there is obviously huge climate damages associated with fossil fuels and um, whether in the context of your proposals there are ways to bring these climate damages into those calculations or do we need some kind of shadow price uh, which just quantifies the, 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 the damages which I believe you know uh, social cost of carbon globally is like 400 
tons and for a barrel of oil is like 175 uh, dollars a barrel of oil. That's the that's the damages we're we're creating, and how how can we bring these damages into these calculations, or ma at least make them visible? Just quick answers from everybody. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So quick answer. I mean, I think bidding mechanisms are very interesting. I think that was part of the the German uh, coal program was a sort of reverse auction to decommission uh, coal. Um, I think you know you then have a question about well, how much are people willing to pay and how much are people willing to accept. Um, I think you would still want, in a world of scarce resources, a good sort of analytical basis for you know which projects are being put up for bid in which countries. You know, do we really think we're getting value for money? I don't think an auction guarantees, in any sense, value for money in an economic terms. Um, and then I think you still have those commitment issues over you know if you have an auction and someone pays an upfront amount to to not develop fossil fuels, what happens when the economics change and the prices change, and how do you stop people reneging on those deals? So I think a lot of the problems still exist, even if you go down the bidding route. Okay, quick answer on damages. So carbon take back obligation, uh, uh, simply no, there is nothing there on the cost of a damage for fossil fuel production. It's about incentivizing and, and phasing out. But I do think, uh, and this is just for inspiration for the room, this idea of obligating on certain uh, elements of damage, for example, like you could you could incorporate that. And in addition to that, I really want to emphasize that there are certain projects in fossil fuel industry that are much more damaging to local environments, to communities. Thus, thus projects or those projects can obviously be, be banned on, on individual country basis or, or, or in, in other decisions. But the carbon take back obligation is more of a, a, a bigger mechanism for that process that I showed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think all what we have seen here is a version of the beneficiary pays principle someone is willing to pay because he or she is damaged or potentially damaged and so the, then the question is how to channel this, this the funds to avoid or reduce those damages in which ways to which actors to achieve the uh, capacity reduction or, or, or production uh, less reduction so in the sense it's essential to I would say the damage with auctioning mechanisms so um, I agree. That's a short answer, I, but I see more problems. But uh, uh, let's maybe that's for the coffee break. <laughs> yeah, but I say there's some really good stuff being done by CA100 and, and GE fans. Not not all of it's bad, but um, on the question of socialization of costs, uh, given the size of the private sector exposure, there's going to be a huge resistance to this. And in carbon truckers' work on what we call asset retirement obligations, when a company comes to the end of its life of oil and gas, it's got a whole load of sites that re need remediating. What they're doing is they're putting it into dud companies that then go bankrupt, and then the state is picking up the cleanup clean up costs. And we, we reckon there's 200 billion bucks of unfunded liabilities in the US alone. That's just a classic stark, stark it's on Carbon Trader's website, stark reality as to how uh, these costs are socialized on the broader public, and it's the taxpayer who pays, it's not the company who pollutes that pays. I mean, all, all I'd say is that sort of the model we're proposing, oh, not the model we're proposing, we're highlighting the risk to investors. And so ultimately, that will come through in a different policy action and different environmental cost burden onto the individual projects and will impact their relative positioning that the cost curve. I suppose we're not trying to factor in for that for that piece, but it, but it's certainly, it's certainly the model will take account and the, sort of the approach we're looking at will take account of such such things as they change. I mean, so it's not incompatible, I suppose, is what I'm trying to say. On the, on the social cost of carbon, so just to clarify, I um, took a, just a um, positive approach to uh, trying to see what happens even if countries are very short-termist and that they use a very low like $36 cost of, um, social cost of carbon and uh, to show that um, despite that we can get, get cooperation uh, under the mechanisms I proposed. Of course, there's no, no way a normative uh, statement we shouldn't discount the future just because it's a future. It's just uh, I'm assuming that, that countries uh, do so in the simulations, and yet we get some cooperation. Um, now, I stand between you and lunch. The, uh, the organisers did ask me to end on a positive note. <laughs> <laughs>
a, a, indeed a highlight from me from the conference today, perhaps because I'm renowned for always being negative. Uh, so, so my positive is that I've really detected a high degree of cynicism and scepticism. <laughs> I haven't got to the joke yet. Um, like we're all used to techno optimism. And at this conference, I've felt very comforted by the degree of uh, scepticism about accounto optimism. The idea that dodgy carbon credits and offsets and all this net zero stuff, the imaginary creative accounting is is going to fix things. And I think a fossil fuel supply conference is the perfect foil to that. Because if we're still expanding fossil fuel production, guess what we're not doing? Like if we're actually increasing coal and gas production, guess what we're not doing? We're not heading for net zero. So there's truth in talking about this stuff. This is where the rubber hits the road and, and all of the bullshit accounting concepts used to offset this and generate that. Like if we're not actually measuring those real emissions, well, we're going to be in trouble. So yeah, it's nice to be surrounded by a bunch of cynics. There's my... <laughs>